Men of the armed forces, I've been asked to say a few words about our fascist enemies. The enemies we've got to smash if our world, our land of America, our kind of free and decent life is to survive. I don't say our kind of life in this country is perfect. There are things I don't like and things you don't like. A lot of things could be improved. But as one who has spent the last eight years mostly in the totalitarian lands, I can tell you that what we have is infinitely better than what they have or what we'll have if they win this war. The difference is this. They're slaves and we're free. But we won't be free unless we win. You hear a lot of talk that we're fighting to make this world a better place to live in. And of course we are. With Hitler and Hirohito and the little Ducha out of the way, their murdering and plundering stopped, it follows naturally that it will, will be a better world. It will be a world with a little decency and human dignity restored to it. And that's very important. I've seen what happens to nations and peoples that Hitler conquers. I've seen how he destroys them with a brutality, with a ruthlessness that you have to see to really comprehend. It seems to me, therefore, that to begin with, we're fighting to avoid that fate for ourselves, to avoid being destroyed and being enslaved. We're fighting to survive and to remain free. And if that sounds to some of you a little academic, I would remind you of what happened, say, to the Poles and the French. I saw them destroyed and enslaved. And I'd rather be dead, and I think you would too, than to have that happen here. For some 3,000 years now, the military leaders have always emphasized that it's absolutely essential if you're going to win a war, and you and I know we're going to win this one, that it's essential to know your enemies so that you're able to size them up, estimate their strength and weaknesses. In my small way, I'd like to try to do that today. In the past, we have often been guilty of underestimating our enemies. You remember those stories so current six months ago about those obsolete Jap planes and those miserable little pygmy Jap pilots. Like most Americans, I believe them then. One personal word here, if I may. I want to assure you that I am not one of those armchair civilians who has come to incite you men in uniform with a lot of fake atrocity stories about the enemy. The truth about him needs no adornment. In my job, I got to know something about our chief enemies, the Nazis. Those very able thugs, some of you no doubt, are going to get acquainted with before this war is over. About the main enemy, the other main enemy rather, the Japs, I have no first-hand knowledge. I know only what you know, that they're treacherous and cruel. If you remember the authentic accounts of the horrors they per perpetrated in Nanking, when they captured that great Chinese city, you could not have been surprised at the story the other day of how they had bound 50 British prisoners in Hong Kong to stakes and then bayoneted, bayoneted them to death. It was not new. The Japs have been doing that in China for years. That's the kind of soldiers they are. The Italians are also among our fascist enemies, but the chances are you will not meet many of them in this war. Being, in my estimation, a rather decent people, their hearts are not in the war. They're mere prisoners of the Nazis. You know the story of the Italian and Frenchman who met on the border the other day. The Italian said, How lucky you French are. What do you mean, lucky? asked the Frenchman. Why, in France, said the Italian, you at least have an unoccupied zone. That leaves us our Germans to deal with, our Nazi enemies. And they're the boys who are out to conquer the world, including our world. Two things might be said about the Nazi Germans at the outset. First, they are out not only to conquer our world, but to smash it. Second, in attaining that goal, they will stop at nothing. Let me explain what I mean. Take the first point, the Nazi goal. You all know what Hitler has, has said in his book, Mein Kampf. There he states his aim bluntly. It is to make the Germans supreme masters of the globe. That is the Nazi objective. But it goes further than that. Hitler says 
The enemy is to be annihilated, not only conquered, but wiped out. Now, in this country, there is a lot of silly talk that aims to distinguish the Nazis from the Germans, the party thugs from the German army, which we are told is made up of nice, clean gentlemen. One of the greatest of our American writers has recently written a very moving novel and made it into a very successful play. And in all sincerity, he makes out a group of German army officers in an occupied town as very decent chaps indeed, as gentlemen who hate the dirty job Hitler has given them. In my own experience with the German army in Poland, Holland, Belgium, and France, I personally saw only two German army officers who hated the dirty job Hitler had given them. The rest were enthusiastic about that job, and they killed very cold-bloodedly for Führer and Vaterland, as they put it. After all, it was not only the Nazi toughs who admitted what they were trying to do. Three years before this war broke out, the German army itself defined very precisely its aims in total war. They were published in the German military publication Deutsche Wehr. Let me quote. Total war, said the German army, means the complete and final disappearance of the vanquished from the stage of history. That, from the German military men, who squeal like stuck pigs at the pinpricks, we administered Germany after she was beaten in the last war. When we won, we didn't try to erase Germany from the stage of history. Instead, we, especially the Americans, tried to help her up on her feet. But if Germany wins this time, let's have no illusions. With the nice gentlemen of the German army doing the dirty work, she will try to liquidate us completely. War, of course, is no sissy's game. But the Germans are always complaining that their enemies don't fight fair and clean. Well, let's see how the Germans fight. The slaughter of civilians, especially of women and children, has been frightful in this war far worse than in any previous war in history. But it was no secret in Berlin that the mass killing of civilians was done very deliberately by the German high command. It was part of the new total war, part of Hitler's calculated strategy of terror. Consider Warsaw. It was completely surrounded by the German army two weeks after the Polish campaign started. The fighting elsewhere was over. The city could not possibly hold out more than a few weeks. But Hitler wanted to give the Poles and the world a lesson. He knew there were more than half a million women and children in the city. And so he turned not only his bombers on Warsaw, but had his heavy artillery fire point blank into the city. The slaughter of women and children was indescribable. Was that an isolated instance? Well, consider what happened eight months later. Hitler had invaded the West. The Dutch, instead of surrendering, as the Germans had asked them to do, were fighting. The German high command decided to give them a lesson. It gave the order to wipe out the central part of the city of Rotterdam by a dive-bombing attack. Now, this attack was not carried out against Dutch troops. Only a few of them were in the city. It was a deliberate decision on the part of the German military command to slaughter not opposing troops, but helpless civilians. The Germans figured it would be so frightful it would induce the Dutch to surrender, and this strategy of terror succeeded. The butchery in Rotterdam will be remembered for a thousand years. In that spring that Hitler threw his armies into the West, a bunch of American correspondents arrived in Calais or Dunkirk, I forget which. The town was in flames, but... That wasn't what struck the newspaper man. What struck them was that on the quay, a long line of Red Cross ambulances had been smashed to smithereens by a German dive bomb attack. The wounded killed in their stretchers before they could be placed on ships. Goering's bombers had done it deliberately, for the pilots could easily see the Red Cross signs painted on the top of the ambulances. Later on, as we went into Paris with the German army, we found one of the reasons why the Germans refused to respect the Red Cross sign. They were abusing it themselves and supposed that the French and the British were too. In a big German gasoline dump north of Paris, 
I saw myself scores of German tank trucks disguised as Red Cross ambulances. To avoid being bombed, these trucks carrying gasoline for Nazi planes had big Red Cross signs painted all over them. That was one of the ways that the German army fought. Well, for a while, it was an invincible army. Nothing stopped it. The French, for example, seemed paralyzed by the very sight of it. But our Russian friends have shown us that that German army is not so invincible. That good as it is, it can be stopped and beaten back. How did the Russians stop it? By doing three things, I think. First, by fighting. And the Soviet army was the first well-equipped army on our side which did stand up and fight in this war. Second, the Russians found the answer to the mechanized panzer attack. They learned how to defend in depth. They crushed German infantry and artillery, which came in behind the tanks. Third, the Russians found out what everyone knew all the time or should have known, that that much-advertised Stuka dive bomber is not much good when you put some fighter planes against it. Well... What the Russian army has done, we can do too. The time is late. The Germans are still strong. Their air force is immense. So is their tank corps. They still have a lot of fight and cunning left in them and cruelty. And they grow desperate. Their increasing plundering and murdering in the occupied lands shows us that. But they can be beaten. And it will be our job to help finish them off. I thank you.